So today I would like to talk about uh, maximum average power transfer in an AC circuit. So it's my understanding that you guys have had Thevenin equivalent circuits and the maximum power transfer theorem for uh, DC circuits before. Is that correct? You guys remember what Thevenin equivalent circuits are? Kind of. All right, well, then let's talk about it really quick. Okay. So Thevenin's theorem uh, says that we can replace any two terminal linear electrical network, which is the only thing that we're going to deal with, um, with a practical voltage source. So effectively, it doesn't really matter how complex my circuit is, I can pare it down to a voltage source in series with a resistance. We can obviously use seven and equivalent circuits, or it may not be obvious, but we can use seven and equivalent circuits in AC circuits as well. So for example, I'm gonna take something uh, similar to what we I asked you guys to do on one of your homeworks. Let's call this uh, five angle zero degrees amps. Let's call this impedance ZA. Let's throw a voltage source here that is 20 angle zero degrees volts. Let's have an impedance ZB here. And let's have an impedance ZC here. Let's say that ZA is six plus J 10. ZB is 15 minus J2. And let's say that ZC is 10 plus J3 ohms. I want us to find the Thevenin equivalent circuit. with respect to the impedance ZC. So our Thevenin equivalent circuit, just as a reminder here, is gonna have some Thevenin voltage, VTH. Um, actually, let's say that these are RMS quantities, just because we're gonna do a power calculation in a minute, so it might be useful to use RMS quantities. This ZTH. And then over here will be VC. I'm going to rewrite that Z because it looks too much like a two for my taste. So effectively, we are going to replace everything that's connected to that impedance ZC by its seven and equivalent. Uh, and the reason we would do this is because this small circuit here is way easier to analyze if we're only interested really in what's going on with ZC. Okay. Um, so we have to figure out how to determine that Thevenin voltage VTH and that Thevenin impedance ZTH. So to determine the Thevenin voltage, we are gonna take our original circuit So here we have that current source that is five angle zero degrees amps RMS. Here's ZA. 
20 angle zero degrees volts RMS. Here's ZB. We are going to disconnect impedance ZC. And the Thevenin voltage is the voltage drop across the open circuit terminal. So this sound familiar-ish. Okay. So for this particular circuit, how would I figure that out? Anybody have any thoughts? So I don't like the way that you phrase that because voltage doesn't leave anywhere. Current leaves terminals and all that kind of stuff, but voltage is just a potential difference between two points. So I don't quite follow here. Um, so if I looked at this, how I would figure out what VTH is would be to write a KVL equation around this loop, okay? Um, so I'm gonna arbitrarily assign impedance ZB a voltage VB. And if I write this KVL equation, that's gonna look like negative 20 angle zero degrees volts RMS plus VB plus VTH. That should be lowercase because that's what I'm using here. Is equal to zero. Just simple application of Kirchhoff's voltage law around a path there. Rearranging a little bit. I could find that my Thevenin voltage is simply 20 angle zero degrees volts RMS minus VB. So what's VB? I disagree. VB is the voltage drop across that impedance ZB. So let me ask you guys a question. What's the current flowing through impedance ZB? There's no current because it's an open circuit on the right-hand side. So if there's, sorry, what? There isn't, the voltage drop is zero. Yeah. Which means VTH is simply 20 angle zero degrees volts RMS. All right. So now we need to define, or we need to determine um, the Thevenin impedance. Let me write this down. So in order to figure out what our Thevenin impedance is, we're gonna disconnect ZC because we're trying to find the Thevenin equivalent circuit with respect to ZC. But we also need to be dealing with a dead network. And a dead network means that all of our independent sources are turned off. Okay. So I'm just going to redraw the network as a whole. So we start with the network with ZC disconnected, and now we're gonna turn off our sources. So when we turn off a voltage source, what do we replace it with? A short, absolutely right. We replace a voltage source with a short circuit because we want zero volts. Okay. So I'm turning off this voltage source. How do I turn off a current source? Open circuit, absolutely right. 
so that we know no current can flow. And we're going to look in through the terminals where C was. Okay. So what do we see? So for A and B to be in parallel, they have to share both pairs of terminals. They definitely share a pair of terminals in the middle, but they don't share the terminals on the outside. They're not in series either. It's just ZB. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just ZB, right? If we effectively, if we connected a test voltage source here, let's just call this V test and measured a test current, the Thevenin resistance or the Thevenin impedance in this case would simply be the ratio of V test to I test. All of the current that's supplied by that voltage source is only going to flow through ZB and return back around. None of it's going to be able to flow through ZA. So ZA shouldn't be part of our Thevenin equivalent impedance. So we figured out what our Thevenin voltage was. We figured out what our Thevenin impedance was. So coming back up here, we have an electrically equivalent circuit that is 20 angle zero volts RMS. Uh, in series with ZB, excuse me. And then here is ZC. And if we were interested in power quantities related to the impedance ZC, this would be an easier circuit to analyze, right? We can figure out what the voltage drop across ZC is very easily. We can figure out what the current flowing through ZC is very easily. And from there, we can calculate all different things about the complex power, right? So this was a, a very brief review on determining Thevenin, uh, the Thevenin equivalent circuit. So I just want to be really clear here. The Thevenin voltage is the open circuit voltage looking in through the terminals of the element that we're interested in. The Thevenin impedance is the impedance looking in through the terminals of the element that we are interested in when we're looking at a dead network. So we have to turn those independent sources off. Okay, so now let's circle back around to the topic at hand. Okay. So this was a brief rehash on seven and equivalent circuits. Um, maximum power transfer for DC circuit. All right, just gonna very briefly go over this. So, If we have a DC Thevenin voltage connected to a Thevenin resistance, and that practical voltage source is connected to some load, which I will just call R sub L right here. I'm going to call this voltage my load voltage and this current my load current. The voltage drop across my load is going to be what? You guys remember voltage division at all? RL over RTH plus RL times VTH. Absolutely correct. What's my load current going to be? 
how can current and voltage be the same thing? The current flowing through those two will be the same thing, but that doesn't tell me what it is. So you're trying to do current division, but current division means we have a current that's splitting up between resistors in parallel, and this is resistors in series. So resistors in series carry the same amount of current. VTH over RTH plural. Absolutely right. Just simple Ohm's law. Write it up here. What's the power absorbed? B times I, absolutely right. So that's going to look like VTH squared times RL over RTH plus RL quantity squared, right? So I'm going to scroll down here. Actually, let me see if I can set this to where we can still see what was there. I'm going to plot P as a function of RL. So if I have PL as a function of RL on my vertical axis and RLs on my horizontal axis, if I were to graph this, it would look something like this. So starting over here on the left-hand side, we have zero. And as we move further and further to the right, we're looking at RL getting closer and closer to being uh, an open circuit. And from this graph, we can see that there is a specific point that corresponds to maximum power transfer, right? So there is one specific value of RL that causes maximum power transfer from my seven and equivalent circuit to occur. Does anybody remember what that is? So when RL is equal to the seven and resistance, we have maximum power transfer. We can derive that by taking the derivative of this PL expression with a uh, with respect to RL and setting the derivative equal to zero and get that result. I don't want to bog you guys down with calculus when the result is that simple. So in a DC circuit, like, let me write this down actually. when our load resistance is equal to R7 and resistance, and our equation for maximum power transfer, P max comes out to be one fourth of V7 and squared divided by R7. Okay. Well, when we have an AC circuit, we have a similar result, but we have a little bit of a problem because instead of having a simple resistance where everything is real, we're dealing with a seven an impedance where there may be some imaginary part to it as well. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about now. So maximum average power transfer, we're going to look at effectively the same circuit, but from an AC perspective. So we have some RMS 7 and voltage.
connected to our thevenin impedance. And now we were going to connect some load impedance. And we're going to figure out what VL and IL are. It's the exact same thing we did up here, except now we're going to use ZL, ZTH, and VTH with a squiggle over it, right? So we can say using voltage division that VL is VTH times ZL over ZTH plus ZL. And IL is equal to VTH divided by ZTH plus ZL. And we want our average power. So our average power here is going to be the magnitude of VL times the magnitude of IL times the cosine of theta VL minus theta IL, right? So just to be very, very clear here, This is our real axis. This is our imaginary axis. And we have some complex power, SL, the projection onto the real axis is the average power that we're looking for. The average power is simply the real part of the complex power, right? So this VL times IL is the magnitude of SL, and this cosine theta VL minus theta IL is what gives us the part that's only on the real axis, okay? So it's the exact same relationship that we have been dealing with complex power relationships, but I'm giving you a more formal equation. And we've actually seen this equation before when we were deriving everything, but I told you we didn't really need to use it or we didn't need to remember it because everything is buried in the power triangle and you can just use your calculator to get it. And that's definitely going to be the case here. I'm not expecting you guys to remember this, use it on the exam or anything like that, although you ob uh, obviously could, it would work. Um, I'm just trying to show you where these different things are going to come up, right? So we have an equation for average power in an AC system based on the complex power that we've been dealing with. So now we need to figure out what the magnitude of the voltage is, right? Anybody remember how to take the magnitude of a complex number? So it does have something to do with the Pythagorean theorem. What was that? So if we have VL is equal to VTH times ZL over
ZTH plus ZL. We're going to have VTH times RL plus JXL. So I'm expressing this complex number in rectangular form, right? So I'm saying my impedance has some real part and some imaginary part. The real part is the R, the imaginary part is the X. And then down here, this is going to look like RTH plus JXTH plus RL plus JXL, which is going to be the magnitude, excuse me, uh, my thevenin voltage times RL plus JXL divided by RTH plus RL plus J XTH plus XL. So the magnitude of this thing is going to be the magnitude of, sorry, this should be a VTH here. VTH times the square root of RL squared plus XL squared divided by the square root of RTH plus RL squared plus XTH plus XL squared. The magnitude of a complex number is simply um, the square root of the real part squared plus the, square, uh, the imaginary part squared, which is exactly what we've done here for these rectangular form impedances. Okay. So we have this big ugly thing. Now we're going to do something similar for IL. So IL was VTH over RTH, excuse me, uh, ZTH plus ZL. And by doing effectively the exact same thing, we're gonna have the magnitude of VTH on top. Divided by the square root of RTH plus RL squared plus XTH plus XL squared, like so. So now we've taken care of another thing, right? We're just getting stuff to put into that equation to figure out what shakes out here. Now we need to figure out what the cosine of theta VL minus theta IL is going to look like, right? So we have to figure out what's going on with this part. So I'm going to draw another graph here, and it's going to look extremely similar to the one I just did. Here's my real axis. Here's my imaginary axis. And this is ZL, my impedance, right? My impedance is a complex number. It has a real part and an imaginary part. My projection of ZL onto the real axis is simply RL. My projection of ZL onto the imaginary axis is XL. 
and this angle here is theta VL minus theta IL, right? So I don't know how great you guys' trig is. Um, cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, right? So cosine of theta VL minus theta IL is just going to be RL because that's the adjacent bit and the hypotenuse is the square root of RL squared plus XL squared. And so now we have the last bit that goes into our equation. So I'm simply going to plug these three parts into this expression up here, okay? So we can say that in an AC circuit, the average power is the magnitude of feed thevenin times the square root of RL squared plus XL squared divided by the square root of RTH plus RL squared plus XTH plus XL squared. times the magnitude of our current, which was VTH divided by the square root of RTH plus RL squared plus XTH plus XL squared times the cosine of our angle, which is RL over the square root of RL squared plus XL squared. This bit right here cancels out that bit right there. And so we're left with the magnitude of our thevenin voltage squared times RL divided by the square root of, actually it's not even the square root because when we multiply those two denominators together, it's gonna get rid of that square root. RTH plus RL squared plus XTH plus XL squared. So this is the average power that's delivered delivered to our load impedance, broken down into parts here. Okay. So I hit you guys with a crap ton of math. I 100% understand that. Bored to tears. We're almost done. I promise. Okay. What does the reactants do here? Like, like I'm not. This is a general question. It's in the denominator, right? So if there's any reactants in our circuit, the denominator is getting larger, which means our power is getting smaller, right? So if we want maximum average power transfer to occur, we need to make sure that all the reactances in our circuit cancel out because that'll get rid of that part from the denominator, right? So that means that we need our load reactants to be negative of our thevenin reactants in order to cancel out that part. Okay. So that's one of the two conditions for maximum average power transfer to occur, okay? So if XL is equal to negative 
XTH, then P average reduces to the magnitude of our Thevenin voltage squared times RL over RTH plus RL squared. We look at this equation and we go way back up here and we look at this equation. They're literally the same thing. Seven and voltage squared times RL over RTH plus RL squared, right? So when did maximum power transfer occur when we had this equation? When RL is equal to RTH. So if we put these two things together, maximum average power transfer occurs when ZL is equal to RTH minus JXTH, which is simply the complex conjugate of our Thevenin equivalent impedance. So, Let's go back up to the top here, right? Where we first started things off. What would we need to replace ZC with if we wanted the rest of the circuit to deliver maximum average power? The conjugate. So we would need ZC to be fifteen plus J two, excuse me, couldn't read my own writing there. Ohms of impedance in order for the rest of the circuit to deliver maximum average power. Okay. Our equation or maximum average power is literally going to be the exact same thing. Even down to the RTH part, right? Because we want the reactances to cancel each other out. So in an AC circuit, the maximum average power is going to be one fourth times the magnitude of the seven and voltage squared divided by RTH, exact same relationship. So on your exam, I'm gonna give you a problem for this stuff, okay? Very similar to what we've been doing in the homeworks, something, a circuit, no more difficult than what you had here. And I'm gonna ask you to tell me what the maximum average power that can be transferred to a particular resistor is, okay? Or a particular thing is, all right? Um, so that's the last of the material that's gonna be on the exam. Um, I'm happy to make up another problem and we could work an example knowing what we know now. Would you guys like that or, all right. So let's say 
that we have this guy here. Let's say that we have 15 angle, 10 degrees volts RMS. Here we have a 10 ohm resistor. Here we have a J6 ohm inductor. Here we have a minus J4 ohm capacitor. And here we have a five ohm resistor. I want to figure out Actually, let's call this resistance RL. Let's not even give it a value. Um, find the maximum average power that can be delivered to a well-chosen load impedance that we get on. So we know that our equation is one fourth times the feminine voltage magnitude squared divided by the feminine resistance. So we need to figure out those two things in order to apply this equation. So to find our feminine resistance, or excuse me, to find our feminine voltage, um, we take out the impedance ZL. and determine the open circuit voltage. So how are we gonna do that? Yeah, so let's take um, Avery, right? Let's take what Avery said and let's kind of think about that in context with what I did earlier, okay? So if we were to write a KVL equation around this loop, where I'm gonna call this BJ6, and this voltage V minus J4, what do you think the feminine voltage is based on what we did earlier? Right, so just Vj6, okay. So if we did, wrote a KVL equation here, we would have minus Vj6 plus V minus J4 plus VTH is equal to zero, which would give us VTH is equal to 
vj6 minus v minus j4 and we know that that term has to go to zero because there's no current flowing through that impedance so there can't be any voltage drop over it so what avery said is absolutely correct it's simply whatever's left over after we take into account the voltage drop across the 10 ohm resistor right so we now know that our thevenin voltage is simply the voltage drop over our inductor we also can see by observation that there is no voltage drop over our capacitor. So how are we going to figure out that voltage drop over our inductor? You got all the parts right, but maybe in slightly incorrect order. But I, I, I think I catch what you're saying, right? So. Um, if we were doing voltage division, is that what you were trying to do? Yes. So if we're doing voltage division, VJ6 is going to be 15 angle 10 degrees volts RMS times J6 over 10 plus J6. It's connected to an open circuit. No current can flow through that capacitor. And since Yes, because we have to open it up to find the thevenin voltage. Absolutely right. So that's going to go away. So then I'm going to have 6i over 10 plus 6i. And in polar form, because that's what I prefer, we get 7.717 with an angle of 69.036 degrees volts RMS. So we're halfway there. I'm asking you an honest question here. What did you feel about the difficulty of figuring out what this voltage was? Anything? wild or crazy i'm not trying to be more of an asshole than usual or anything like that but i genuinely genuinely want to make sure that this level of complexity seems fair to you guys for your exam because this is what you should expect okay so now we need to figure out what our seven and equivalent impedance is so that we can figure out just what the real part of that is okay so for the Thevenin and equivalent impedance, once again, we're going to disconnect our load impedance. We're going to redraw our circuit. But we need to be looking at a dead network, which means we need to turn that voltage source off by replacing it with a short circuit. And we look in through the terminals where our load impedance was. So what do we see? Exactly right. So we have negative J4 ohms in series with 10 ohms in parallel with J6 ohms. So minus four I 
plus 10 times 6i over 10 plus 6i. Which I get to be actually uh, 2.647 plus j. 0 0.412. Oh. So if we wanted maximum power transfer to occur, maximum average power transfer to occur, what must the impedance of ZC be? So for maximum average power transfer to occur, ZL needs to be ZTH conjugate, right? Which in this case would be 2.647 minus j 0 0.412 so take the conjugate operation we simply change the sign on the imaginary part or change the sign on the other one, right that 2.647 bit is the rth that we're going to plug into our equation to calculate what the power is, right? But we can't say that in order for maximum power transfer to occur, it's just that 2.647. It's gotta be that 2.647 in series with the negative reactants because we need the reactances to cancel out, okay? So our maximum average power is then going to be 7.717 volts RMS squared. We only need the magnitude, so we don't need to bother with any phase angle stuff there, divided by that 2.647 ohms. And then we have to remember to multiply by a factor of one fourth. So, Zero point two five times the magnitude of what I have stored in my calculator is X divided by the real part of what I have stored in my calculator is Y gives me five point six two five. So expect something like that, but with different numbers. Yes. So if I ask you specifically, that's a very good question. So I might break this question down into two parts. I might ask you, what does the impedance need to be for maximum power transfer to occur? In which case, I will specifically expect you to tell me what the conjugate is. And then the second part would be, what is the maximum average power transfer? So um, if I just said those, like uh, I may have phrased this poorly because I just said simply find the maximum average power transfer. For that, you really only needed to, oh, sorry, I went too far. You really only needed the real part. But I would likely break, I, I like to break my test questions down into smaller steps 
to kind of guide you guys through what I'm looking for. So for a thing like this, I might literally, it might be a circuit, and there might be five parts to it. The first part would be, there are four parts to it. Find the evidence equivalent voltage from the perspective of this impedance. Second part, find the evidence equivalent impedance with respect to a particular impedance. The third part, what value of CC in this case would cause maximum average power transfer to occur? And then part D would be find the, the actual numerical value of the maximum average powers. So that the test question is written in such a way to guide you through the steps to get it correctly. So um, I am a firm believer in partial credit. And I am a very firm believer in trying to be as fair as possible. Uh, and so what I mean by that is, let's say that you made a mistake on the first part. You wouldn't miss the entire problem if you're doing the following steps using the correct procedure. You get full credit for those steps because you're doing it with the wrong answer from the beginning. The only thing I can really say to that is don't be a jackass and say, well, the answer was zero at the beginning. So all of the answers are zeros and I don't have to do any work. That is obviously complete and utter crap. But if you miscalculated VTH, for instance, at the very first part of the problem, I wouldn't hold that against you when you're doing the calculation at the last part of the problem. So I'm not going to re-penalize you for making a mistake over and over and over again, or not even making a mistake over and over and over again, but using the results of a mistake over and over and over again. Did that clarify things at all? Okay. I don't because I haven't made it yet, but my best guess would be like three circuits. So I'm going to ask you guys to analyze three. Uh, so let's see, we have two hours. Um, so I think 40 minutes per circuit. Is that how that math works out right? Seems reasonable. And then each circuit is going to be broken down into multiple questions like your homeworks and all that kind of good stuff, right? So on the homeworks, let's just look at something here. Uh, so let's look at homework number four. And then which one of these is the assignment sheet? Maybe this one. Yep. So none of these actually have a drawn out circuit associated with it, but something like this where it's a multi-part problem where I ask you for something in part A, and then you use that something from part A to figure out what's going on in part B, and then you use that answer from part B in part C, that kind of thing. I might give you a single word problem like this, and I would consider this one of the circuits. Um, or I might give you something like, Uh, because I definitely want to ask you a question with regards to power factor correction. But instead of giving you a word problem like that, it might be like one of these circuits. And then I say, you're going to put a capacitor in parallel with a voltage source. What does that capacitor value need to be in order for the power factor of the system to be raised to some value? That's, that's actually more likely uh, as to what I will do is actually give you a circuit to analyze, ask you for different bits leading you up to that final calculation. Um, so I can't say for sure how many questions I'm going to ask about each circuit, but my best guess would be somewhere between three and six. Uh, and it might not be the same number of questions for each individual circuit. But... Um, the analysis that you've had to do for homework number one, homework number three, and homework number four are fair game. Homework number two, where I was expecting you to use a computer to solve it, that's good practice because if you can make sense out of that stuff, setting up the equations and everything, 
You should be able to analyze the circuits easier, but I can't give you anything like that on your exam uh, because you can't solve it without a computer in front of you. So since I've got two homeworks pulled up, what are your questions regarding the homeworks? Let's start with you. You raise your hand first. Problem three on homework. All right. So we have a transformer supplying power to an industrial load. Okay. So I'm going to draw a circuit for this thing. I'm going to draw it down here. So our transformer is our voltage source. It is providing power to an industrial load through a transmission line. So I'm gonna represent my transmission line as an impedance ZW for the wire. Um, and then I have the load here. And we are told that the load absorbs 125 kilowatts at 0 0.88 lagging. And we are told that our load voltage is 480 angle zero degrees volts RMS at a frequency of F is equal to 60 hertz. So that's how I interpreted the question I asked as a circuit, so that you have a nice pretty picture to look at. Okay. Um, so I want you to determine the complex power absorbed by the load. Oh, and I forgot to make these quantities look pretty, but we'll get to that in a minute. So for part A, we want S load. We've worked similar example problems before. So this is going to be the average power absorbed by the load divided by the load's power factor with an angle of the inverse cosine of the load's power factor. And because the power factor is lagging, we expect that angle to be positive. So to me, that looks like 125 divided by 0 0.88 with an angle of inverse cosine of 0 0.88. Uh, I should write that down. 125 kilowatts over 0 0.88 angle inverse cosine 0 0.88 gives us 142.045 with an angle of 28.3576, so 358 degrees kilovolt amperes, which is exactly what I expected to get. For part B, I want the complex power absorbed by the transmission line. Right. So that means I need to figure out this voltage V wire. And this current I wire. Right. I know all of the current flowing through my transmission line flows through my load. So I could say that S load is equal to VL times IW conjugate. From this, IW conjugate is, actually, let's just find IW. Um, S load over VL. Take the conjugate of that. 
quickly running out of space here. So that is that 142.045 angle negative 28.358 degrees kilovolt amperes divided by 480 angle zero degrees volts RMS. I'm going to write that as negative zero to make sure that we understand we're doing the conjugate. And so let's see. I want the conjugate of what I just stored is X divided by 480. Zero point two nine six with an angle of negative twenty eight point three five eight degrees kiloamps RMS. Um, at some point, I'm going to have to just right on a different page. But anyway, now I'm moving over to the left-hand side because this is where I have blank things. So I have my current, that's IW. Um, so SW is going to be the voltage drop. So that is IW times ZW times IW conjugate, which is the same as the magnitude of IW squared times ZW. So that is going to be 0 0.296 times 10 to the Three amps RMS. Actually, no, let's just write it as kiloamps. That'll be fine. Squared times my impedance, which was given as 0 0.1 plus J0.2. Got a J there. Uh, I'm thinking about the, the units here um, because when I have kiloamps times kiloamps times ohms, that's 10 to the 3 amps times 10 to the 3 amps times something in volts per amps gives me 10 to the 6 volt ampere. So that looks like mega bars or mega volt amperes. Um, so making this in kilovolt amperes, like the answer, we would have 19.582 angle 63.43494, so 4.35 degrees KVA for part C. 
the complex power supplied by the voltage source is simply S load plus S wire, adding those numbers together. Um, and then for part D, so just because I'm running out of space here, uh, once we have SVS, we now have P old and theta old. Um, we have a target power factor, so that's going to give us theta nu. Uh, the voltage drop across our capacitor would be VW plus VL. And our frequency was given as 60 hertz. Just kind of ran out of space here. Um, but we did the first three parts, and then the last part is very similar to the example problems and all that kind of stuff. And I worked in the class. Was that of use? Do you need me to go further, or are you good? Uh, okay. That makes a big difference. Yep. Um, so just to be clear here, if I say the line voltage at the load, then I expect it to be across the load. All right. Um, I think somebody at that table had a question. Okay. No, actually, I am. My expectation is that you should not do either of them because you will not have a way to solve that system of equations. Yeah, no. So my, my expectation there is that you should not have to. Uh, in fact, it isn't my expectation. I can guarantee that you won't have to do it. That being said, um, what I'm expecting you to be able to do is to use things like voltage division, current division, source transformations, maybe superposition to avoid having to do node learn mesh. Okay. So homework one style problems, homework three style problems, which none of those require using nodal analysis or mesh analysis to do. Okay. So I wasn't expecting you to have to use MathCAD for any problem on homework one or any problem on homework three. Um, so these are the, these are as big and gnarly as it's gonna get. Um, to me, they're roughly the same thing. I thought they were. Um, more like the homework. If you, dis, if you think there is a dissimilarity then I'm gonna say more like the homework. Yeah, I'm going to give you, I, I, I have decided that I'm going to give you guys only drawn circuits. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so for your equation sheet, um, you are expected to make your own equation sheet. So one eight and a half by 11 standard sheet of paper, front and back. Um, it needs to be handwritten so that somebody can't make a photo, you know, somebody can't make one really good one and distribute it to everybody. So I want you all to make your own. I'm gonna collect the equation sheets with your exams. Um, with regards to what you put on there, whatever floats your boat. I don't care if you put worked out example problems and all that kind of stuff on there. Doesn't hurt my feelings at all. Um, just, you know, make sure that you can read it and all that kind of good stuff because it's there to help you. I've had a student before uh, who made an equation sheet that contains zero equations. It was literally just all of the dumb mistakes that I had made in the class up to that point and just written down because he was as much of a jackass as I am. So he, he, uh, he didn't need the equations. He made it 100 on the test. So if that's how he wanted to spend his time is making fun of me right now as equation sheet, it is what it is. Yeah.
that's, that's if that's his prerogative or one of your prerogatives sounds good to me whatever makes you more comfortable to take the exam so that you'll be more successful if it's making fun of me then so be it i don't have a problem with it at all yes i'm sorry i can't hear you over the the din of noise what was that absolutely absolutely um i i you know this is your first time having me as a, a professor and all that kind of good stuff um when did you guys take your circuits one last quarter okay so it hasn't been like a crazy long time or whatever since you done this stuff two years ago yeah so for some of you maybe it has been um i'm not i'm not trying to be like, haha, you have to do things this specific way or you'll never get out of here or anything like that. That's, that's not my goal as an instructor, literally ever. I want you to guys to be successful while also learning enough stuff to be able to go out and get a job and not embarrass yourselves or are you embarrassed? That's, that's my goal. For you guys to go out and get jobs, pay taxes so that I continue to have a job. Okay. So. With a real, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, like, I would expect to see. A circuit like one of these, and then at the end, figure out what the power factor is. Yeah. Yeah, it's one really open so, uh, yeah, we have 25 minutes. Okay, what's the concept that you didn't understand? Complex power? Okay. Any particular part of complex power or just complex power as a thing? I had to uh, how much she wasn't paying attention and going back and watching it. Okay. So. Complex power. Let's say that we have a generic impedance Z. Okay. And we have an RMS phasor voltage across Z and an RMS phasor current flowing through Z. The complex power is simply. V times I conjugate. What is conjugate? So the conjugate is from the very first day of class when we talked about complex numbers. Your calculator can do a conjugate operation, but effectively it makes it negative. It makes the imaginary part negative for a rectangular form complex number. Or oh, let me rephrase that. It changes the sign of the imaginary part, or it changes the sign of the angle in a polar form complex number. And your calculator can literally do the complex conjugate operation for you. What type of calculator do you have? The the live on the cast. Um, do you have it here? Yeah. I don't. Oh no, I've got mine right here. That'll work. Or is your dog hair on it? I heard you have a cute dog. I have 
Pete's your dog, in my opinion, but whatever. <laughs> the one that you bring in every week to see Sydney. Oh, that's my mom's dog, actually. <laughs> yeah, no, I had dropped him off this morning. That's why I was a couple of minutes late to class. Uh, so when we're in complex mode, you can press the option key. Option two, copy it. But you don't have to remember how to do shit. Calculator can do it for you. But you do need to remember that when you see that asterisk sign, it is not good. So, what's the difference between the S and the Q? Fantastic question. The P is the real part, the Q is the imaginary part. Exactly. I didn't figure that out. Right. Okay. So, as a rectangular form complex number, you have P plus JQ, okay. where P is average power. Measured in watts, and Q is reactive power. Measured in volt amperes reactive or VARs, mm -hmm. and in polar form, we have the magnitude, which is commonly known as apparent power, measured in volt amperes with an angle of theta s, where theta s is the power factor. So you have a sheet of polar form and USP. If you have s, yes. and you convert it to rectangular form, yes. you have p and q. If you have it in polar form, you have apparent power from so the entire meant. concept of the lecture was just converting it between the types. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. See, that's where I got lost. For some reason, I thought there were different equations for it, and I was just missing something. No. So that's the, there are different equations, and but it can be simplified. It can that? be simplified okay. to this, and gotcha. this is literally how I teach it to my circuits one students, and circuits two students, and circuits three students in electrical engineering. Yeah. Gotcha. Don't bother memorizing 15 different equations if your calculator within two buttons can just switch it to the other form. Yeah. Just remember, average power is the real part, reactive power is the imaginary part, parent power is the magnitude, and power factor is the cosine of the angle. And what is this called? Complex. Power. Complex. Power. Okay, so complex is just all of that information gotcha. put together. Okay, so when you break it down into S load and S Y, like when you have a circuit, how do you differentiate? What is what plugs into each equation? It's just over that specific point, right? Yep, exactly right. Yeah. So if we looked at homework, if you do the voltage over a point, you can do the complex power yeah. over. So if we look at homework set number, let's look at this guy right here, right? So in problem two, I'm asking you to find the average power absorbed by impedance VA, okay? So I can see by inspection that the current flowing through impedance ZA is just that source current IS, right? Because it flows directly through it because they're in series. Um, and IS was given to be five angle 45 degrees. Amps RMS. The voltage drop across A is then going to be the IA. Of ZB and ZC. It's just the current times the impedance, Ohm's law. You don't even need any. Right. Yeah. I forget about the simple stuff. That yeah. sucks. So that's going to be five angle 45 degrees amps times ZA was 12 plus J3 ohms. Um, let me set this calculator to get this one. Sixty-one point eight four seven angle fifty-nine point zero three six volts RMS. So our complex power S A is just going to be V A times IA conjugate. 
which would be 61.847 with an angle of 59.036 degrees volts. RMS times oh shit, five angle negative 45 degrees. I did the conjugate here, but you could literally just have your calculator do it. which comes out to be 300 plus J75 volt amperes in polar form, or excuse me, in rectangular form, or 309.233 angle 14.036, degrees volt amperes in polar form because I wanted average power that so if you can calculate s the complex power you can find any of the any of the things so that's what I would encourage you to do is always calculate s first and then take from s the part you need as opposed to writing down or trying to memorize literally like 10 different equations for the different parts Gotcha. That's the whole point of the power triangle. The power triangle is just a graphical representation of all those relationships, which, just to be clear. Are the answers on the answers like units and stuff, do we have to have the units throughout the calculations? Or does it matter just as long as it's on the final answer? I would prefer that you use units throughout the calculations because I feel like you're going to make less mistakes that way. But as long as you have units at the end, that's all I really technically care about. I think it's very good practice to use units the entire way through. Um, I never seem to be able to convince anybody, but. Yeah, for some reason it bogs up my brain to make sure that's where and if I, I, I can see look units as variables half the time whenever I'm looking at an equation and I'm like, there's way more than I need. I look, yeah, because I can do the number calculations faster and then just go, okay, this is what that unit is. If that's how you guys are comfortable, it's how you're comfortable. I, I, I don't want you to mess yourself up just to make me happy or whatever, you know? Don't say that. <laughs> do it. So that's one of the, the most difficult things about circuit analysis is that there's usually six different ways to do something. Um, and so you just have to figure out what way is comfortable for you. Now, it might not be the most efficient way. Um, it's 40 minutes per circuit. Yeah. So if we go back to that problem um, for B and C, because they're in series. So, in this particular problem, B and C are in series, but the voltage drop across B and C is Vs, right? So, you have Vs right here. So, the, that means the difference between this node and this node is the voltage source. So, the voltage drop across B and C in series is Vs. So, the current flowing through B going to be the same as the current flowing through C because they're in series and that's just going to be Vs over Zb plus Zc. You're absolutely right. And then from there you can figure out what the individual voltage drops are or you could have used voltage division to figure out what the individual voltage drops are and then use the voltage to find the current. Whatever floats your boat there and then it's literally V times the conjugate of I and then pick out the part that you need. So it just affects how you find it. All right, and that, like, if it's a series, and then you go back to the singular for voltage drop and the power. Yep. I'm always, so in, in these problems, I'm specifically asking, you know, the power absorbed by impedance ZA, power absorbed by ZB, absorbed by ZC. So I'm looking at it for specific elements. Complex power supplied by the current source. So that just means you need... The voltage drop across the current source with this polarity, which is just Vs. So yeah, plus the voltage drop over Z. Let me write this as Is. Yeah. 
So this voltage drop is just VA plus VI. Okay. Go back to the basics. Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and Ohm's law will get you farther here than Nodal and Mesh will. Yeah. So I'm 